Our first uh, speaker and welcomer today is Vice Provost Barbara Romzak, uh, who is Interim Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Professor of Public in, uh, Administration. Her key, key responsibilities in her current position include Academic Program Approval and Review for the Kansas Board of Regents, as well as Institutional Performance Reporting for the Regents. Professor Romzak is recognized nationally as an expert in the area of public management and accountability with particular emphasis on government reform, contracting, and network service delivery. Her work has encompassed variety, a variety of work settings, including complex federal agencies such as NASA, Congress, and the U.S. Air Force, as well as state agencies, local governments, and nonprofit organizations. She has published three books and numerous articles. Professor Romsek is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, and she has received awards for her research from the American Society for Public Administration and the American Political Science Association. Help me welcome Professor Romsek. Thank you, Edith. I appreciate it. Uh, of course, all of that public administration background isn't the reason I'm here. I'm here because uh, I, my responsibilities are to welcome you to campus, to applaud you for your long-time commitment to the Center for Russian East European and Eurasian Studies. Uh, I go back to the days when it was called Soviet Area Studies, Soviet East European Area Studies. In my graduate school days, uh, a comparative government was one of my areas. So I, I actually did study Russian and I did study the Soviet Union. But back then, I thought nobody was going to talk to me in the Soviet Union if I was going to ask them about loyalty to the government, which is what I study in public administration, employee loyalty. So I knew, I knew I had to find something else to do, and so I shifted to public administration with an American emphasis instead of a comparative emphasis. But my responsibilities these days uh, include oversight of the international programs. So I have a keen sense of the importance of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies in the hierarchy of international programs at KU. Uh, we are fortunate at KU to have had uh, very uh, insightful leadership 50 years ago. Uh, who uh, deans who supported international programs, who said we may be in the middle of the country, but that doesn't mean we keep our head in the sand, that we need to understand the world beyond Kansas, and he made sure that we have students who are exposed to that and supported programming such as the center uh, to make sure that students and faculty could pursue their, their interests in that regard. Now, of course, the center has, is still here 50 years later, and that's a tribute to the people of KU, not just to the dean who created the program in its early days. It's a tribute to all of you for your contributions as individuals, uh, to the students and the faculty who've done the hard work, and to those uh, distinguished guests who work with our faculty and our students and host them uh, when they visit your country. Uh, we are very proud of the Center for Russian and European Studies. We're very proud of all of our international programs. But, of course, the, the center with its long history enjoys a particular uh, uh, position of fondness in the hearts of, of administrators and in the hearts of uh, students and alumni. Of course, we want to uh, congratulate the center on its most recent receipt of a grant from the Department of Education. Many of you know the Title VI grants and how important that is for the continued success of the organization. Those are competitive grants. They don't give it to us just because they, they like us. They give it to us because our program stands out in comparison to other universities that are seeking the same funds. So the, the, uh, the center succeeds because of the hard work of the current people in the program, not just uh, because of the hard work of the past. Uh, we are uh, really proud of the fact that the center branches out and is working with the Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, we have a number of programs where, oh, sorry, that's mine. <laughs> I always have to ignore it. I, I turned off my phone. I didn't turn off my alarm system. I'll talk fast and then we'll get over there. Um, <laughs> It only rings for a little while. <laughs> uh, anyway, we do a lot of work with the Foreign Military Studies Office for the Center for Russian East European Studies. 
Many of our programs at Foam KU are with, with KU faculty help Fort Leavenworth by teaching students over there. This is for military studies collaboration is where our students benefit from the program at the fort instead of the students at the fort benefiting from our faculty. So th that's a really important program. And we want to encourage even more of those uh, kind of initiatives. And, and the last indicator of success is the recent uh, support we've gotten for the, the new scholarship by Peter Jarosavich. Jarosavich. Excuse me, my Russian is really old. <laughs> But uh, that's a Polish name, if, I, if my ethnic background is Ukrainian, okay. Uh, in any event, congratulations to the program for the support of its alumni. Congratulations to the program for the success of your students. And uh, we anticipate another 50 years of, of great uh, success. Thank you. Right on time is what that means. <laughs> <laughs> We've got our alarm clock uh, marking time for us. And now it's my singular pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Barbara Bacchus McCorkle, uh, who has been from this program before it ever existed. Um, she was married for 28 years to Oswald Bacchus, and she raised a family with at least one son, Tony, who I don't think is here right now who caught the language and area studies bug, and a granddaughter in high school who's now in hot pursuit of the Russian language. Um, and I love about Tony that he, he brings workers from Russian-speaking workers and so forth that help him in his building trade. Um, so that's everyday practice at work there. Ms. McCorkle has a master's in library science and worked for a number of years in the libraries at Purdue and Yale universities rising to the position of curator of the map collection and lecturer in the Department of History at Yale. She has numerous publications on the subject of maps. So, but today, we have the pleasure of hearing some of her reminiscences about Professor Marcus and how SAS got started. Please help me welcome Ms. McCoy. Welcome to this conference, which celebrates the 50th anniversary of what started in 1960 as an area program in Slavic and Soviet area studies. It takes me back to a hot August afternoon in 1950, when a new young KU assistant professor arrived in Lawrence with his wife and two baby girls. Lawrence was a small town then, about 18,000 inhabitants and the University of Kansas boasted an enrollment of some 9,000 students. <coughs> Contrast that with today's statistics of nearly 100,000 in the Lawrence area and 30,000 students. But things were changing as hundreds of ex-soldiers on the GI Bill wanted to get an education and came knocking at KU's door. In the fall session of 1950, the History Department, which for some years and had a faculty of only eight professors responded to the student increase by having three new young faculty, enabling the course offerings now to include American colonial history, French history, and Russian history, a big jump. However, that fall, the fall of 1950, the only course that would fall increased purview today <coughs> was elementary Russian and selections from Russian literature taught by Professor Sam Anderson. And Sam was a professor of German in the German department, which dangled a few courses in Russian as an appendage to their other offerings. By spring of 1951, Sam had added a language lab in Russian, a lab in Russian reading and grammar, and reading in technical Russian, <coughs> while the history department offered its first course in Russian history as assistant professor Oswald Backers was listed as teaching medieval Russian history. Where Hans and Kenneth Spencer, a search library now since, 
on the lip of the hill overlooking the Campanile was a motley collection of old army barracks, which housed the classroom, classroom or teaching Russian. The history department, which now occupies many rooms in Wesco Hall, occupied one big room in Strong Hall, where the faculty desks <clears throat> sat cheek by jowl, some face to face, offering little privacy for any faculty student interchange. In the fall of 1953, the German department hired Professor Werner Winter. He joined the faculty of the German department, but began to offer some courses in Russian. By 1954, students could study intermediate Russian conversation. In 1956, there were more courses in Russian grammar and intensive reading, and future historians could choose among such courses as Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union and the history of Southeastern Europe. In 1957, the political science department <coughs> brought a young new professor in to teach government of the USSR, Professor Roy Laird. The ball was rolling. By 1959, Professor Laird was teaching Soviet policies and programs and a seminar in government and politics, the USSR. The history department had added a course in revolution and counter-revolution of the 20th century. More university departments, aware of developments in Eastern Europe, began to pay attention to the area, and students reading the course catalog for 1960 discovered that there were now four faculty teaching courses in Russian, as Professor Stammler, Kovar, and Tarenko had come to KU. Noted historian Peter Scheibert came as a visiting professor from the University of Marburg and taught a course in Russian history. And the geography department now listed a course on the geography of the Soviet Union. What had been a gleam in Bacchus's eye during those years became a reality with the formation of the Slavic and Soviet Area Studies program in 1960. And when the course catalog for 1961 came out, it listed 22 courses on the heading departments of Slavic languages, history, political science, geography, economics, and philosophy. In the span of only 10 years, starting with a single course in Russian and then a single course in Russian history, interest in what was then the Soviet Union had spread to interest in all of Eastern Europe, from two departments to seven, from a faculty of one to a faculty of a dozen. I leave it to others to come up with a number of course listings, the departments, the distinguished faculty of today, but I ask you to remember where it all started and reflect excuse me, and reflect on the journey that has brought Kreese eminence. I wish I could remember the names of all the wonderful young faculty, Aussie work, that some of you may, and, but I can't. But I know some of you are here today, and I know that you're going to have a very exciting day, afternoon and evening. So all I can say to you is enjoy. <laughs> Now it's my singular pleasure to introduce my Slavic colleague uh, and former director of Greece, Maria Carlson, who is a professor in Slavic languages and literature, courtesy professor of history here. Professor Carlson served for 11 years. I think after, okay, after Fletcher, that's, that's the second, yeah, longest. Um, 11 years as director of, at, this, at Crease, uh, from January 1992 to August 2003. Um, this was just at the time when the Soviet Union collapsed and the former Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc began to reinvent themselves. Professor Carlson brought the center through the time of transition in our world area into the age of technology and reporting and the post-Cold War shift in funding priorities. More of that in Professor Carlson's talk. As director of Crease, Professor Carlson won grants to support educational development, language proficiency testing, public administration training, student, um, student exchanges, and small business development, bringing over six million uh, in external funding to Crease and KU. She increased the visibility and effectiveness of Crease within the university, in the state of Kansas, and nationally. She was the single national area center director invited to work on the task force that developed the online reporting system, 
currently used by all of us now in the Title VI centers. She also served as Vice President of the National Council of National Resource Center Directors. In December 2000, Professor Carlson received the Distinguished Service Award for Academic Leadership from the International Relations Council in Kansas City for her work on, on national, international education in her area. Professor Carlson has also received individual research grants, including IREX, Fulbright, NEH, and Hall Center for the Humanities. <coughs> in 2005, she received the ATSEAL National Award for Excellence in Teaching at the post-secondary level. And last year, Professor Carlson was inducted into the KU Women's Hall of Fame for her many contributions to the university. Professor Carlson's teaching and research focus focus has always been on interdisciplinary. She is sort of the heart of, of um, area studies. She publishes in the fields of Russian literature, speculative philosophy, and occultism. I don't know what the army thinks about occultism. Um, <laughs> literature, folklore, and nice. intellectual history. <laughs> Her working languages are Russian, Ukrainian, and German. Help me welcome Professor and former students and current students and friends. So to all of you who have contributed in various ways to Reese, congratulations and happy birthday. The first thing um, I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a big hello from Bill Fletcher. Uh, Bill could not be with us today, uh, but he was up to visit family recently, and we had a chance to uh, sit down, and I told him about the anniversary event. And he asked me to be sure to convey his best wishes and warm regards to all friends and colleagues. That doesn't really sound like Bill, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he was sincere. <laughs> anyway, Bill uh, should be here, but he's not. And uh, so to represent Bill, I have brought a picture. So if... Um, Art, if you could bring that picture up and take a look at show. <laughs> Do you remember it now, Richard? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Are you going to explain I am, I am. <laughs> Those of you who knew Bill knew that that picture always hung in his office, wherever his office was. And he told me two things about it. Uh, first, he told me he kept it to remind him of happier days in the Navy when he found Jesus out at sea. That does sound like that. <laughs> I'm sure he told other people, I'm sure he gave other explanations to other people. That's the one I have. The second thing he told me that I was not under any circumstances to let this picture go out of crease. It was the talisman that kept the enterprise afloat. <laughs> Bill was always a complicated man, <laughs> hard to pin down, uh, liked to pretend he was dumber than he was. He once told me that he was giving pleasure to his colleagues uh, by allowing them to think that they were smarter and better than he was. <laughs> Still, I mention Bill because he was an excellent mentor and a senior colleague. Uh, an excellent mentor to me, and I want to take this moment to acknowledge his considerable contributions to Greece, uh, <clears throat> and to make sure that we never lose that talisman. <laughs> I also want to use this uh, occasion to share some thoughts about area studies, as I've thought about them and observed them uh, for the last 20 years or so. I feel I've been writing about area studies and speaking about area studies since the early 90s, and I have. My last foray into meta-area studydom was only two months ago, almost to the day. So I'm sincerely hoping this marks my last foray today. Earlier, uh, Richard DeGeorge talked about the founding and evolution of Crease. And getting a ship like Crease built, launched, 
properly navigated uh, takes a lot of effort and commitment by many people. By the time I came on board and I started working with Crease on various initiatives and projects about 1989, construction was long over and things were sailing right along. You see how I am suddenly maintaining the naval metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Then came 1991, an important year. With powerful 2020 hindsight, I now realize that I was an absolute idiot to have accepted the responsibility for the center. <laughs> <laughs> if only we knew, right? It could have ended very badly. Fortunately, it ended, it ended okay for most parties. Uh, including myself. But there I was, a brand new area director, and uh, suddenly I had to write my first Title VI NRC proposal. That was bad enough. <coughs> but I had to do it just as the Soviet Union disappeared. <coughs> the Cold War ended, and Eastern Europe was intently studying its name. So what should a Soviet and East European area center be doing? <laughs> in these circumstances. And that's when I understood what my mission was in the history of the center. Uh, my assignment, uh, for better or worse, was to get the center through the time of troubles mm -hmm. uh, and out the other side, intact. And it's a good thing I like to problem solve because I found myself with a bummer crop. We looked at the new world, we tested different possibilities, we consulted with faculty at KU and with center colleagues across the nation. I'm not going to list all the things we did. But first we had to raise our profile. The profile we were not sure we still had. We did a series of successful outreach conferences, we did strategic planning, um, we worked with other entities. We hosted Central Slavic twice. That was an adventure. We did uh, film and lecture series and took teachers to Siberia and St. Petersburg, hosted hundreds of visitors, built a model outreach program. And we listened to responses uh, from our world area and from our clients. I hate to use that word, but you know, the people we serve. We did try developing Central Asia early on, and some of you may remember three consecutive USIA grants with Kyrgyzstan as a joint project with the Office of International Studies and the KU Med Center. Uh, led to some interesting things and a great relationship with Rosa Akumbayeva, uh, who was then a little less famous than she is now, but just as smart and impressive. Uh, perhaps we were premature in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the project did not take. But Central Asia stayed on the radar, and uh, uh, perhaps our project served as a tiny time bomb that later led to the first collaborations with the East Asian Center and some of Chris's later initiatives under Eric Karen. We also worked with Ukraine and developed an abiding relationship with Lviv University, part of which you saw today. Uh, Bill Fletcher. Suborn Paul Danieri into Ukrainian studies after Paul's dissertation. Paul wrote a dissertation on perception of gain in U.S. Soviet arms control. He defended it in 1991. <laughs> so suddenly Paul became a player in Ukraine. <laughs> The Ukraine project, funded by numerous SSRC and USIA State Department grants, became a significant umbrella for extensive KU academic, business, and community outreach, as well as study abroad and collaborative research. It culminated in the selection, well, it hasn't culminated yet, but one of the good things that came out of it um, is that in April 2001, <coughs> Uh, KU hosted an international conference on building a vital U.S.-Ukraine relationship. It was sponsored by the Supreme Allied European Command, uh, the U.S. and Kansas National Guards, and co-sponsored by Kreese, and our friends at the Military Studies Office and the Command and General Staff College. It was a biggie. And I still have General Ralston's coin. <laughs> 
Yes, I was coined by a four star who was NATO's supreme allied commander. Eat your hearts out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kreese's list of Ukraine initiatives alone is over 12 pages long. I looked it up for this. But it was only one of our initiatives, and I use it as an example. In the first decade uh, after the collapse then, Greece's primary mission was to shape a new profile for a new world order. So the 1990s were a period of cautious experimentation, a uh, little bit of reconfiguration, some building of infrastructure for that recon reconfiguration, and a considerable amount of heartburn, worrying that we might be doing the wrong thing and going in the wrong direction, or doing too much or doing too little, or something. But the challenge was not just a matter of shaping a new profile, if it were only that easy. Not only had the world changed, but so had the perception of various studies, particularly Russian and East European area studies. Without the Cold War, who cared about the Russians? Who cared about East Germans? What was East Germany again? How about Poles, Ukrainians? Who are these people? Why should we bother to learn their languages? What's the point of studying these countries? Who cared about them? So by 1995, the demise of area studies was being widely assumed, not just predicted. The area studies infrastructure had been built to study Cold War institutions. Cold War institutions had collapsed. Areas and area infrastructure had been built to predict how many Politburo members could dance on the top of the Lenin mausoleum. <laughs> but now there was no more Politburo. <coughs> True, the mausoleum is still there. We do not yet know the end of that story. Dire predictions for the non-future of area studies came from other directions as well. The transitional period was marked by changes in the social sciences, which had moved in the direction of rational choice theory and quantification. Uh, political science and economics in particular seceded from area studies. You will never know how many hours I spent hashing this out with Ron Francisco. <laughs> Globalization, internationalization were the new buzzwords, and again, area studies were deemed passe. Well, these issues, too, have moved up. After 2001, there was a pushback against the hegemony of rational choice and quantitative theory. You heard about it this morning, appropriately led by, or inappropriately led, depending <laughs> on whose point of view, uh, by a young political scientist using the pseudonym Mr. Pistroika. Russia has given the world so much. <laughs> the global versus area issue has also shaken out as we came to realize that global international studies work on a horizontal axis, axis, sorry, and they look at a single issue across a variety of world areas. Area studies work on the vertical axis and look at a contextual body of issues by probing deeply into a single world area. The first often requires little language and area knowledge. The second requires a great deal. Do we need both? We need both global and area studies? Yes, yes, actually we do. They ask and they answer very different questions. And there are uh, obvious synergies there. But back in the 90s and into the start of this decade, it did not look promising. But then sometimes history taketh away, and at other times, history giveth. It turns out that area studies scholars ended up in front row seats in History 101 for the last couple of years. Cast your mind back to when the USSR collapsed. Remember when Harvard economist Jeff Sachs was going to um, build the Russians a new economy by flying to Moscow on weekends twice a month <laughs> and scraping it all out uh, so that they could become capitalists just like us? Uh, the estimate then was that it would take the Russians about 10 years to get their act together uh, and become just like us. So that would put the transformation into 2001. Time has passed. 
The idea was we would no longer need Russian and East European area studies. And anyway, the whole world speaks so much. And remember how nationalism and identity issues were deemed so very 19th century and so very passé. Ironic, isn't it, that when the Soviet Union collapsed, its historical attempt to internationalize collapsed. Uh, and the whole empire broke apart into nationalisms and started rooting around in its respective pasts, its ethnic psyches, and its native languages. Ditto the Balkans, where the defeat of 1389 somehow managed to remain front and center in national <coughs> consciousness and continue to rankle. This is the only part of the world where Bosnia, and Croatia, and Serbian are three mutually intelligible but completely different languages. <laughs> and we can all think of other examples. Meanwhile, the Russian government continues the good fight against the lowest common denominator factor of globalization, represented by us, by Western mass and popular culture. There has been pushback in uh, all parts of the world, not just our part of the world, to the homogenizing impact of globalization. We haven't seen the end of that play out. I have no idea where all this will lead. Maybe I should have said that up front before I said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do know that the phenomenon is going to keep area studies on the radar screen in some form uh, for the foreseeable future. The government has been putting additional resources into supporting, by the way, language and area studies because, you see, the government has also been enrolled in History 101. I like to think we were getting the higher grade. <laughs> What we couldn't know in the 1990s was that history would step in to put a dramatic stoplight, a spotlight, sorry, well, maybe stoplight, uh, on the importance of area studies and area centers. Uh, government and military enterprises in the Balkans, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and other arenas did not go immediately looking for monolingual globalists or internationalists or quantitative social scientists as they worked to meet their new missions. They sought area specialists who had deep cultural, historical, anthropological, and linguistic knowledge. And they found a serious shortage of such specialists. We heard about that in our second panel today from Tom Wilhelm and Jim Kipp. The immediate result of recognizing this need has been uh, an expansion in the number and focus of U.S. Uh, Title VI, U.S. Ed Title VI international programs. Uh, this year, uh, there was a language area research center, resource center uh, competition, and 15 language resource centers were awarded. This is up from nine in 2001. I don't know how many National Resource Centers were awarded this year. They have not posted, and I couldn't get an answer out of them yet. But we do know that uh, there were 123 uh, National Resource Centers for Language and Area Training by World Area, the grant period that ended in 2009. And that's up from 109 in 1998. And, uh, uh, and you can add to this nine international uh, resource centers, which combine several world areas. The U.S. federal government has designated um, a category of critical languages, targeting for funding Arabic, Farsi, Persian, Chinese, Indonesian, Korean, Hindi, Urdu, Turkish, Turkic languages, certain African languages, and Russian. They created new entities. CASEL. CASEL is a really strange thing. CASEL is a Center for Advanced Study of Language. It's at the University of Maryland. And it was founded in 2003 as a DOD university affiliated research center that is specifically dedicated to addressing the language needs of the intelligence community. Then we have the National Language Flagship Program, 
a major new initiative now involving 15 to 20 partner colleges and universities and offering intensive language training and special flagship fellow uh, programs. We have the Critical Languages Scholarship Program for in-country study and uh, the National Language Service Corps. And these last three are under the aegis of NSEP. These are all new initiatives. So it doesn't sound like this is going away. The interesting point here is that many constituencies from within the academy, the State Department, and the military have repeatedly pointed out for decades, and I myself have gotten this lecture at least four or five times at various area studies conferences and meetings, that the U.S. needs to create a constellation of specialists, different disciplines, different world areas, and not go chasing shooting stars as they erupt from different parts of the night sky. By the time a major comet appears, it's too late to trade that cadre of linguists, historians, cultural specialists, anthropologists, and others to deal with it. You have to have the constellation of resources in place across the sky, banked and ready, because you can't predict what part of the sky the next comet is coming. Who would have predicted in the mid-1990s that we were shortly going to be engaged in lengthy military actions in Iraq and Afghanistan? And that we would have immediate need of highly trained translators and culture specialists with deep area and language knowledge? If those specialists had already been available, might the whole adventure have turned out to be quite possible. These new initiatives and others I haven't mentioned have directly benefited area studies because they provide the culturally contextualized training that must accompany language knowledge for it to be useful. <coughs> One other interesting thing that's happened with the formation of these new initiatives uh, is this. In the good old battle days of the Cold War, <coughs> Area studies privileged the social sciences, specifically political science and economics. The new model emerging has so far been much more inclusive and has privileged softer social sciences, anthropology and ethnography, sociology, psychology, cultural and demographic geography, and the humanities, language, culture, history. Still, there's one thing we can't ignore. This money remains connected to government security and military spending, just as it was in 1958, when the Title VI programs were first introduced as part of the National Defense Education Act, NDEA. These developments reveal yet again the deep roots of area studies and policy and national security needs. And national security needs have been redefined in a much more broad uh, way uh, to include economic security and social security and other kinds, but still national security needs define the mission. Islamic studies has been the best beneficiary of this government sector's largesse from the very beginning. And many of you have heard me say before that it is now too late for Russian and Eastern European specialists to go back and become virgins again. <laughs> now about the future of Slavic area studies, I want to make uh, two points, and they take a long-term view, because you know, I mean, we see what's happening around us immediately, but these kinds of things change really over a considerable period of time, not instantly. So two points. The first point is that with the end of the monolithic Soviet structure, um, our part of the world has fragmented. And as our world area has fragmented, so is, has our definition of what area studies is or should be. It's necessarily fragmented. As our world area searches, we search. And my second point is we really can't expect this 
former USSR to reinvent itself in 10 years, and we should not expect anything different from us, from ourselves. We are not going to reinvent area studies in 10 years. Ultimately, what area studies is or is not will be determined by the people who identify themselves as doing area studies. I think it's just that simple. I think the time will come when area studies become passe, but that time has not yet come. It's not about the areas or regions competing with disciplines. It's about how the reality of other parts of the world figure, figures in our reality and shapes our knowledge structures, and that includes knowledge structures at the university. When knowledge of other parts of the world, the need for knowledge about other parts of the world, is firmly embedded in all aspects of our curriculum and our research, area studies will be passe. We won't need it. But as long as American institutions and culture remains predominantly monolingual and monocultural, area studies will have a role. Okay, that's essentially my talk. Bear with me while I take this moment uh, for some personal reminiscences and some thank yous in turn. It's been a lot of thanking at this conference. Being director of Crease was one of the most enjoyable, frustrating, nerve-wracking, exhausting, and exhilarating things I have ever done. I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but professionally speaking, I, I wouldn't have traded those 11 years for anything, not even an extra book or two. Who needs books? I refer you to the 15-volume collected grant proposals of Maria Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bestseller, <coughs> perhaps, but every one of those grants did something to support students, to encourage study abroad, to provide faculty development funds, to give resources to library, to take crease out beyond the university, to build new programs, and to advance research in our field, and to promote not just our program, but our field. Uh, it's a way to give back. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the best things uh, about being the director of Crease is getting to work with wonderful people. Crease faculty make the greatest colleagues at KU. I got great advice from many of you. I remember running to Richard on several occasions. What do I do now, Richard? And you were unstinting in your willingness to engage in projects, workshops, conferences, whatever the center had going. Cree students are terrific. The FAOs are super. Many of them have gone on to great careers in respect and recognition in their own professions. I want to briefly recognize some people who are here and some who are not. I'm going to offend some of you uh, because I'm not going to mention you, but that does not mean you were not important players or that I do not remember your contribution. It means I'm running out of time. I want to mention Darlene Haycock, the crease den mother. That's what we called her. She protected me from Will. I want to mention Betty Luther, my right hand woman, right over there. Yes. Not only my right hand woman, but shall I tell Betty? my partner in crime. <laughs> Betty was never averse to helping me push the envelope or break out of that box. <laughs> Today, Bill London carries on the good work. Lynn Tomlinson built a model outreach program out of practice. <laughs> the Department of Ed used her materials and projects as templates for other Title VI centers and tapped her experience. Wow. Two people who are not here are Bruce Berglund and Alan Holloman, who were super assistant directors. Alan was going to be here, but at the last moment had family issues that could not wait. Both Bruce and Alan are now tenured professors 
one at Calhoun College, the other at William Jewell. Alan made full last year uh, and won a whopping grant. <laughs> and Bruce is the only professor I know who gets only rave reviews on Rate My Professor Duff. <laughs> 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 In spite, in spite of the fact that many students note that he is the hardest professor I've ever had, I have learned that his infinite supply of incredibly snazzy vests <laughs> continue to fascinate his students at Calvin as much as they fascinated us. <laughs> I'm so proud of both of them. Uh, Bruce and Alan today have been very ably replaced by Bart Redford. Bart. Uh, whose first connection with Crease was as one of the Crease uh, students and then as my best ever senior student employee. <laughs> I also feel very grateful to the entire Lonard clan <laughs> and friends. Uh, Dad, Larry Lonard, who taught Russian at Topeka High, dutifully provided a body for the teachers' workshops and travel programs when we needed one. Uh, his son, Jeff, and his daughter, Kristen, gave content continuity to our office staffing. For years, we had Lonard in the office. It was great. We still speak of the Lonard dynasty. <laughs> the great thing is that just about everybody I worked with is still connected in some way, either with Crease, with the field, or with international programming. When your staff is great, they make you look great, and they make your program look great. Okay, done now. Anniversaries are a time for remembering and for being grateful, and I'm very grateful to colleagues who stepped up, to staff who stepped in, and went the extra mile. And I'm grateful to you for being a very patient, postprandial audience <laughs> and letting me maunder a bit. So let's wish Crease another 50 years as interesting and event-filled as the last 50 have been. Wait, maybe not that event-filled. <laughs> Any event that manages to top the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I never thought to see that in my lifetime. Any event that tops the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union might turn out to be hazardous to our health. <laughs> Thank you very much.